Hey everyone, so in this video what I want to do is I just want to take you through the energy setup that's going on in this home. I've got a lot of products in here but it wasn't always like that. In fact it started off really simply and it's grown over time. So let's just have a quick look at what we've got going on in this home. So for this video I thought it'd be worth putting together a bit of an infographic so bear with me it's no masterpiece but I think it's going to be a lot better than um, taking you through uh, all of the kind of uh, individual installations uh, visibly because it's going to be more complicated especially when we start to get into the consumer units and things like that. I will put a few clips in of the equipment as well but We'll always reference back to this um, this this graphic. So first off, here we are. We've got my home, and the first thing that we had fitted to this house a number of years ago now was the solar panels. So it, with the solar panels, we had 16 solar panels uh, put on the roof. They were actually not quite arranged like this. There was four on the front, 12 on the back. Um, that was just how much uh, our roof could accommodate, um, and that's a four kilowatt system. Now there's a number of different options that you can go for and your home is going to dictate that some of the time uh, because of the amount of roof space etc. Um, you can get different wattage panels so the panels that we've got here is a fairly standard setup because they're uh, 250 watts each um, and then there's 16 of those to make up the four kilowatts. Now these panels are by no means the highest output panels. You can now get panels going on to towards 400 watts a panel. Um, and if that was the case now, if we had 400 watt panels, we'd only need 10 of those panels to do the four kilowatts. Now the thing is, of course, is that there's a price you pay and there's a, uh, uh, you know, a number of break points you can get. You can get panels now from as cheap as 79 pounds, but you know, some other types of panel can cost many hundreds of pounds. So there's a, there's a lot of choice out there. Now in our case, underneath each of the panels is a microinverter. That microinverter means that each of the panels is working independently. What that means in terms of wiring for the house is that the microinverters convert the DC current uh, coming off of the panels into AC. If you don't have a microinverters underneath uh, each of the panels, you have to have a, um, a larger inverter, um, uh, either in the loft or in the garage, wherever is convenient for your household. Um, and these take up a little bit more space, but there's pros and cons of both approaches, um, especially when you're getting into battery storage as well. Perhaps the bigger and in single inverters are actually better. So, you know, there's pros and cons there. We like the flexibility. We also like the fact that if one of the panels got, uh, you know, some kind of grime on it, it wouldn't actually affect the energy consumption of the of the other um, panels in the system. The um, end phase uh, microinverters are also the gateway uh, onto the internet. So there's a gateway that attaches to the internet, and this is um, what makes it possible for the app uh, to access the system and get the information out. And you can see here we've got some information about the energy consumption throughout the day. This is where it all started for us with the solar panels um, and if we open up the home now what we can start to see is where some of that energy is going. So the first thing that we did was we uh, added a device which can heat the uh, hot water in a hot water tank through the immersion heater. Now normally an immersion heater would just be activated on a timer or uh, just literally a switch on the wall in some circumstances. Um, what we've done is put an eddy device, we had a, a solar eye boost before that, um, but we have an, a, an eddy device and they're both working exactly the same way. Um, they measure the uh, generation going onto the grid and as soon as you go into generation and, and, and you're pushing more energy onto the grid, it will start to put the exact same amount of energy into the hot water tank. And, and essentially you get free hot water uh, whilst the sun's shining and the tank uh, needs the hot water. Once the hot water reaches a predefined temperature which you've set on the thermostat of the immersion heater just like 
um, any other immersion heater, it, the immersion heater will cut out and then it won't uh, use any more electricity until such time as the tank um, it needs more heat in there. Now the way that the uh, My Energy product works in, in this case is that there's a separate Harvey unit uh, attached to the main consumer unit of the house and that's got two inductive clamps on here, you can see them in black. Um, one is measuring the generation from the solar and you can see where the solar system comes into the um, uh, main fuse board here. The wiring here is really kind of guidance, it's, it's, it's missing a lot of detail including all the earths and all the neutral connections. Um, but you can see here that the, the solar comes in through the wall, um, it goes into an isolator switch and then it goes into an export meter, that's where you take your meter readings if you're being paid for the energy uh, you're pro producing through the feed-in tariff. Um, and then it goes into a breaker just like any other uh, system uh, in, your, in your home. So we're then measuring that generation using the Harvey unit. And the Harvey unit's really clever because it scavenges enough power off the inductive clamps to power the device itself so you don't need any batteries and that's one really really good thing about the MyEnergy products over some of the others on the market. Now you can also see that we've got an export uh, import uh, uh, reading being taken here on the um, on the second clamp and that means that the Harvey unit can delineate between the consumption in the home, the generation from the roof, and whether there's any energy being exported. The third device in this chain is the hub, um, which is over here in the living room, uh, on this drawing anyway, it's not really. Um, and um, that's connected to the router, uh, which connects it out to the internet so that you can see all of this information on the app. And the app works really well, uh, showing you where your energy is going, and what devices are consuming what um, and at what time and you can see then how much energy you're exporting versus how much energy you're importing. Uh, you can see all sorts of detail there on when the devices are working plus you can also configure those devices to a certain extent through the app itself so you can set priorities um, and more about that as we as we go on. So if we head outside into the garage area um, and uh, add the electric car which is um, ha, uh, at least trying to look like a Renault Zoe but uh, I wasn't going to spend any more time on it than I absolutely had to. Um, we uh, have a Zappi uh, unit on the, uh, on the wall uh, which is powering that car. Now that um, necessitated uh, for our case anyway installing a secondary consumer unit uh, on the wall of the garage uh, which is um, which is powered by uh, the main consumer unit in in the home and that was purely because the distance between the garage and the um, main consumer unit would have meant a lot of ugly cabling going outside the house um, to connect it up to the zappy so it wasn't something we needed to do necessarily but it was something that I wanted to do and make the, the installation a bit neater but also um, to kind of future proof ourselves if we wanted anything more uh, in there and also to separate the garage electrics from the, the house electrics so lighting and, and, and um, the plug sockets uh, in there. So that works out really uh, really well actually um, because we're now going for a second EV and um, indeed we have that second EV um, and that will uh, be coming with its own charger um, for the vehicle to grid stuff. So um, the Zappi unit communicates uh, in a mesh uh, wirelessly with all of the other uh, My Energy devices in there. So it also takes the readings from the Harvey unit, um, which is looking at how much energy is being imported and exported, and any excess will be uh, used to charge the car if the car is plugged in and you can set a load of features here um, to you know charge the car overnight if you're if you have a, a tariff like I do so I'm on the Octopus uh, Energy Octopus Go tariff which um, I'll put a link to my referral code in the in the description but that um, allows me to charge the car at 5p per kilowatt hour um, overnight 
um, uh, when the energy is cheap, when there's you know an oversupply of energy, or uh, you know when people generally aren't using a lot of energy, um, the companies can buy that energy much more cheaply, so they can pass that saving on to you. Um, and as we don't mind when our cars are charged, we can charge that overnight. Now. One thing here to note is just how much energy um, we actually produce um, in excess of what we need in, in any given day. Um, it's not quite the height of summer yet, it's, it's kind of early spring at the moment and you know on a really you know fairly decent day we can produce up to 10 kilowatts of electricity. Now it's, it's been a bit cloudy today but we'll just have a quick check to see uh, what we've what we've done today because the last couple of days have been really good and today's been a little bit cloudier so we'll just get some um, we'll get some statistics up for you as I speak so here we go we've got uh, currently this is a current situation according to the app here um, if we go into the uh, history we can see here that today, okay, a bit cloudy, we've consumed 7.4 kilowatt hours of generation, we've exported 4.2 kilowatt hours of generation, and we've used from the grid um, 4.3 kilowatt hours of, of, ge of generation from the grid. So um, still, even on a cloudy day, um, uh, you know, a bit of sunshine in, intermixed with cloud, um, we've got 73% of our energy there um, through the uh, through through the through the solar, which is great. Now, if we'd have had an electric car on there as well, uh, 4.2 kilowatts isn't 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 bad. Um, you know, that's that's uh, that's 10 percent uh, of the um, the battery in one of our electric cars because they're 40 kilowatt hour electric cars. If we go back to um, yesterday, and you can see again, you know, 5.6 kilowatt hours of e electricity, um, and consume generation 10.5. Now one of the things that we can do is then we can go down and we can actually look at where that energy was consumed and you can see that it was consumed by the eddy unit uh, which is heating our hot water. So we could have actually chosen if an electric car had been plugged in to prioritize that over and above that and we can do that through the app just by touching on it and dragging the, um, the, the, the things around there to tell the app which one of those devices to prioritize and it does that really nicely and that's the main reason that we went from the solar eye boost to the eddy unit so that everything could be controlled in in the one system so that's the system as it goes and you will have seen a video uh, perhaps the other week and I'll link it up here uh, where we had a play around um, preparing some additional sensors uh, in the garage for the new charge point and the reason that we did that is because the new charger for the car will require a CHAdeMO uh, connector to do the vehicle to grid because CHAdeMO is one of the only connectors that can actually do the vehicle to grid bit um, and um, what we can see here is um, those additional sensors being plugged into the garage fuse box here and what that will do is that will uh, limit the consumption of the Zappi unit in case both chargers are, are running at the same time because the cabling can't support uh, the um, uh, both chargers charging at 7 kilowatts um, because that, that would be 64 amps um, and uh, that that's a lot so your, your incoming uh, fuse uh, on your house will be 60 100 amps you know within that range ours on this house is 100 amps but still, it's a lot of electricity, um, it's a lot of amps uh, to pull through the wiring, and the wiring actually wouldn't cope with it. Um, you would trip the 50 amp breaker uh, in the main fuse board if you tried to do that. So um, we need a, a system that's actively monitoring the uh, energy flow and will adapt uh, how much consumption happens. It's, it's a pretty rare, and it would be very unusual for this use case to happen, but uh, for the installation to kind of meet the regulations, um, this this is something that has to be considered. Every every eventuality has to be considered because otherwise, you know, one day someone will just come home, forget about it, and and you'll you know you'll trip the breaker. And while that's not going to cause a fire or anything, it will trip the breaker. But if you don't realise the breaker has been tripped, then you're not going to have uh, the amount of 
uh, electricity you thought you were going to have in your car when you come back out to it. So, uh, not great. That's uh, just a little video on the setup. Um, I hope you found that useful. Um, I hope that answers some questions that I've had in the comments um, from, from previous videos about you know, why have you got this, what are you doing with this, all of that kind of thing. Um, and um, yeah, we'll keep this up to date. We'll come back when we add some new things in here. Um, but I thought I'd just put that together just so that everyone can see exactly where um, we're at and what we're doing um, here in the home. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.